church said, let's just write down, since we using things from Girdle and Claney that worked out the details there, uh, we only need a finite number of definitions in order to get to a non-recursive set uh, in terms of number theoretic functions. So we just have to axiomatize that part of arithmetic using symbols for those functions to, to get something in first order logic, which then would give the um, undecidable ability because of the non-recursiveness of the set being defined. Much later, influenced by uh, Tarski and Mostowski, Raphael Robinson came up with a very small fragment of arithmetic. I mean, you can't get smaller than this. A property of successor, a property of zero, the recursion equations for plus, the recursion equations for times, and then it shows that in terms of fairly complicated logical formulae, you could get to that non-recursive set. Of course, much later, we know from Hilbert's 10th problem that you can just do it in terms of polynomial equations to uh, get there. But that's, that's, there's a theory. Those students who have been suffering under logic, I mean, I think I could keep them sitting still long enough to explain this theory to them. It's not so, so uh, complicated to do, thanks to Robinson's insights there. So that was Church's solution. Now, Turing's solution was to say, wait a minute, I defined the universal Turing machine, which then leads to a way of uh, notating things for any computation, and therefore the non-recursive uh, set. So let's just axiomatize the universal Turing machine, the action of the universal uh, Turing machine. But if you ever suffered through Turing's paper or tried to make up your own universal machine, it isn't a lot of fun because what he did, though it has philosophical significance, was to analyze the action of the machine into very atomic acts. And you have to sweat an awful lot on a single tape to get everything to uh, come out. <laughs> now, later on, uh, people, starting with Shannon, uh, uh, had lots of competition to get the smallest universal machine. And that's quite fun. I tried to find a snappy example on the internet. You can find so much on the internet these days. But I, I couldn't really find one that was really attractive. And of course, the trouble with the small machines is you have to encode everything very much in order to get to the universal property of it. So it doesn't lead to such snappy axioms for doing it. But of course, in principle, we understand that Turing solved the problem uh, in that way. Now, Post had already thought of the idea that was pretty much equivalent to Turing's machine earlier than uh, Turing, but uh, wasn't able to uh, publish his results. And he, and independently Markov in Russia, came up with the idea that you can do everything in terms of very simple kinds of formal systems, which are just rules for specifying how you change one string of symbols, your hypothesis or antecedent, into another string of symbols and the consequence. And so Post then worked out, he actually used the Turing machines, that we can make this uh, symbol manipulation into equations in a uh, associative uh, system there, and that the unsolvable problem would be just on the basis of the associative law there, uh, and take some constant generators there. Does a set of equations in an associative system lead to another equation there? Of course, you use the rules of equality that uh, Euclid uh, gave us. If uh, equals are multiplied into equals, the results are equal to give those uh, deductions there. And so it's really nice that that's an example of the problem. But still, if you take the universal Turing machine, it's a very long thing to write down what would be the unsolvable. I mean, when you think of the class of problems, you see it's unsolvable. But if you wanted a more specific example is um, the um, universal Turing machine again. In the meantime, and uh, Church must have met Curry and Gertingen in the, about 1929 when Curry was working on his uh, thesis there. Earlier, Schoenfinkel 
was a fairly crazy Russian and apparently disappeared into Russia after he left uh, Germany and uh, no one heard about him. Had uh, Schoenfinkel had formulated an idea of using functions that take <coughs> arguments as functions and produce functions in a completely type-free way. And Curry took that up when he discovered uh, Schoenfinkel's uh, idea. He had had independent ideas and he uh, incorporated uh, Schoenfinkel. And then, of course, uh, Church, with his theory of functions in the lambda calculus, they realized that it was the same thing to do things in terms of combinators and uh, lambda calculus. I'm not going to try to explain lambda calculus here. The combinators are very easy. What Curry only needs is the constants, the combinator k, which when given a constant value there, gives you the function that always takes on that constant value. And then Schoenfinkel's com combinator, and that's the key thing that makes things undecidable here, is that uh, given two functions, x and y, if you think of another argument there, you give that argument to x, you have a function, and then you uh, uh, compose that with y. Uh, there at the same z there. See, what, what makes this undecidable is that the z gets doubled there. And so expressions are going to expand and may take you a long time to get them small again there, and that's the combinatorial difficulty. So this is an example of an undecidable theory in first order logic, and the, an undecidable question is, does a term in K and S reduce to some fixed term in K and S? <coughs> that's Church's numeral zero. I'm not going to uh, really explain it, but just say, does a term reduce to some fixed given term? That's an unsolvable uh, problem on the basis of those very, very simple axioms. I'm now going to give a different version of this. I'm going to try to combine Curry and Church and Glaney and Rosser and Turing together in one <coughs> system here. The problem with uh, Curry's theory here is proving it's consistent, by the way, but also, the thing is, it's non-deterministic. When you just give equations and you can say you replace equals by equals, you can replace the equals by equals in any place. And so it's non-deterministic where you do your next replacement. So what I'm going to do is to give you a very quick system here in the next few minutes where I replace things only at the left-hand end of the string. Now, to make that left-hand end of the string, stick out like a sore thumb, I'm going to write things in reverse Polish notation. So instead of writing f of x the way we usually do, I'm going to erase the first parenthesis and reduce the second parenthesis to a period. Okay? But it's reverse Polish notation. It's a binary operation of application of a function to an argument. But I'm going to use another application of a function to an argument, reading from left to right, and said, wait a minute. Calculate the value of x first, and then apply the function to it. You see, the first one says calculate f first. That may be a compound expression for function. Do the function first, and then pay attention to the argument. So I'm going to do it both ways there uh, to have a deterministic system. So here's the syntax. Maybe we don't want to read it. I can just say it. We have variables, if you like, but we won't actually use variables. But constants, uh, for the combinators, I have to add a Q combinator uh, for a technical reason, never mind. Terms are made up out of the constants and the two application operations. A combination can no longer be reduced by the rules of the combinators if it doesn't have enough junk uh, on it, because the rules of the combinators from Curry's axioms uh, require a certain amount of stuff before you can uh, make the reduction. And then just technically there, when you have one of these reduced things, you might have a chain of additional arguments there which could start up other reductions there. And so that's just a syntactical name for things there. So here is, here is Curry's uh, reduction rules in my uh, 
deterministic left-right way. If you have a reduced term followed by some other term there with a double dot there that says, oh, okay, you finished that first one, so now turn things around and start reducing the term and give it the argument there. So that's that way of being able to sequence which steps are done in which order. Now for K, S, and Q, K says do a cancellation, S says do a duplication and set things up one on top of the other. For Q, I have to have one there that says, oh, okay, we can do that reverse trick there. So I'm just making the double dots into a combinator here in order to have a simple relation between expressions and combinations. So the whole point, which Curry knew very well, is that no matter what gigantic formula you think of, you can always program into a single constant combinator so that if you give it the arguments x, y, and z, it will then reproduce by those reduction rules any formula in this notation. And of course what Gödel and Kleene did was to see that the recursive functions in terms of certain numerals, certain expressions there, could always be obtained by reduction rules there if you give it uh, the expression that corresponds to one numeral and start reducing it will eventually get to uh, the value there. And so now, you don't need to read those. Uh, I, I hope I wasn't too, too fast there to say that there are certain syntax and reduction rules here. And now we just have to axiomatize that. Turing said axiomatize the universal Turing machine. I'm saying axiomatize the reduction rules and so this is completely mechanical to write down word for word what I said informally about defining induction there as first order axioms. And so uh, again there, uh, if you formulate the problem of taking a constant term and asking will it eventually reduce until it comes to an end halt, that's the typical example of the undecidable problem. So this is the universal Turing machine, what I've done here is I've not made a stored program computer, right? I've made a, I've made a stored computer program. Everything is expressed in terms of the syntax, and the syntax has both the programs and the tape, the amount of space that you want to use to do it, and so uh, therefore it takes less axioms to do it. I thought of that 50 years ago. I wouldn't have rev revolutionized logic if I proved it, but I thought thinking back historically here uh, that uh, you, you, you ask yourself, how did people think of things and how did they uh, come upon it? And so just like school missed the chance to prove the, the completeness theorem, uh, Gödel didn't say it fast enough to give the Entscheidung's problem, but finally the penny dropped and uh, the things can be expressed in a very uh, direct, direct way. Thank you for your attention today.